Carolina Works is brought to you in part by the South Carolina Occupational Information System, South Carolina's official career resource network and your pathway to success. Coming up, it's the top law enforcement agency in the country, but getting into the FBI isn't easy. Come January 1st, employers face a new immigration law that tightens up hiring practices and deals out some tough penalties. What does a former stock trader do when he's tired of the rat race? In the case of one Columbia man, he takes an old airport hangar and builds some spiffy new apartments. All this and more on Carolina Works. Hi everyone, I'm Clark Newsom, and this is Carolina Works, the monthly news magazine of the South Carolina Workforce System. As the threat of foreign and domestic terrorism has grown since 9-11, the role of the FBI has expanded to keep pace. This month we visit the South Carolina headquarters of the country's leading law enforcement division, both to learn the role of the FBI in national security and to find out what it takes to join. Also, later in the program, we'll get an update on a new immigration law that goes into effect in January. And we'll meet Joe Dick, a Columbia developer who left the financial world to pursue a personal dream. First, here's our visit with the FBI. I'm Mark Wade, and we're here at the FBI State Headquarters in Columbia. As one of the central law enforcement agencies in the country, it naturally attracts people with an interest in solving mysteries, people like Julie Johnson. When um, I was a little kid, I just loved reading The Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, um, Happy Hollisters, and um, I think the turning point in my life was when my parents gave me a Hardy Boys um, encyclo encyclopedia of crime and it would tell you what to do on cases and that kind of thing. And so in my basement, I actually had set up a table, put the little book out there and created my own little lab. And I used to do fingerprinting with Jello powder. And so, you know, again, it was just one of these things I just really enjoyed solving the crimes in the books and seeing who done it before, you know, the, the end of the book came. Finding out who done it became a lifetime passion and the FBI became just the place to practice it. I mean, we have type A people. We have people that love good cases. We have people that, that love the excitement of what they do. And generally, the agents I have here, I've got, they'll come down on, on large cases, big indictments, tons of work, and then the next day they're in with the next one saying, I'm ready to start again. I mean, they very seldom do you see agents take downtime for doing anything like that. I mean, they're very aggressive, and they know there's always another case out there, and they'll go from one case to the next to the next to the day they walk out the door. We all want to succeed, we all want to achieve, um, and we all want to know. And so I think that's, that's a really good quality to have, is, is just an insatiable curiosity about things. One of Julie's early cases meant paying close attention to the daily activities of one of the most notorious spies of the 1990s. I was actually on the investigation of Alder James, who was the CIA spy. Um, and I was actually one of the monitors um, that was on this investigation and hearing um, both he and his wife um, talk about um, the espionage activities that he was doing um, was probably the highlight of my bureau career. Um, it, it is something that I hope to never actually ever hear again. Things come in on a daily basis that we react to and uh, an agent may be involved in an investigation. It might take them three or four years to complete one investigation if it's a very large, complex, white collar type case that they're going through truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of documents. and the. Uh, and I think that's the one thing that you see at the FBI. If you look at some of the, of the bombing of the World Trade Center, when you have to send teams of people in, and you sift through all of the debris that came into that, and you find one little piece of metal that was the VIM plate, or the, the vehicle identification plate off the vehicle, and the agent traced back and find out who rented the truck or who rented that vehicle, that actually leads to that is the, the agents will do meticulous investigation to get to, the, to, the, to find the facts if they have to, and we, and we, very, and we specialize in that. Every FBI job is different. Every agent coming in goes through Quantico, through the basic agent class, which is 26 weeks now. And then after they graduate, depending on what type of work they do, it's, it's unlimited the type of specialty training that could be. When I came into the FBI, 
a large focus we were doing was what we called cold gem then, which was Columbia and Jewel Thieves. So the Bureau sent me all over the country learning how to be a, a certified gemologist. I went to diamond schools, I went to pearl schools, I went to gold schools, so I could work undercover and, and uh, looking at Columbia and Jewel Thieves. And uh, later on, I, w I, I went down a technical track for the Bureau where you know, they taught me how to do you know, covert entries on houses, alarms, locks, safes, all those different types of things. And I went into cybercrime after that where they, they taught me how to you know, spend a significant amount of money on how computers and networks work, how the internet works, and how to investigate those types of crimes. And, uh, and I've had a very technical type track. But we also have any other, you know, we have, we have polygraphers, we have firearms people, we have our scientists, we, we have anything you can name, we probably have one of somewhere. FBI job applicants can expect a security check that starts at the beginning and can literally take years. We look at uh, the background investigation from the time you were born until the time you come into the agency. And it's a very extensive background process. We go back to, the, to college, we talk to the roommates, we talk to classmates, we go back to every neighborhood you've lived in, we talk to the neighbors on either side across the street, we talk to every employment place that you've ever been, every job you've ever had. And so it is, it's very selective because of, we're, we're entrusted with, with top secret information. And we're entrusted with some of the most uh, protected information in the United States. So we have to make sure that the people that we have coming in ha have the capability in order to honor that trust that's put into uh, with us by the American people. Agents also have to be ready to adapt to new challenges at a moment's notice. We have teams that, that we send all over the world and almost any major event that's ongoing in the world right now, we will send and we will dispatch agents out to those events, whether, it, whether a plane goes down, whether it's a prison riot somewhere in the United States, anything that happens, agents have to be, they're required on a two hour notice to be able to leave and to, to go anywhere in the world if they're called. We're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, that any agent in this office, if I call them, they, they have to respond within two hours. For those who make the cut, the range of job opportunities is limitless. We have anything you can possibly imagine. I mean, you know, the normal, Agents are divided up into what we call squads and they work different violations. You might be on a terrorism squad here. You might be on a white collar squad working uh, bank fraud or, or bank embezzlement. You might be on a violent crime squad working gangs. You might be out doing applicant interviews or we just had uh, went through a presidential election. A lot of the responsibility for some of our agents will be doing background investigations on the new cabinet and the new uh, presidential administration coming in. And uh, that, that responsibility falls to us also. But it takes a lot of people to make this organization work. You know, we've got photographers on staff, we've got evidence recovery people that go out and do our evidence, we've got people that, that handle all our, the money and the finances and just the facilities them, themselves and keep the facilities uh, running for eight different offices around the state. The FBI was a product of changing times and in a post 9-11 world, it still is. Technology, if you kind of look at it, is, 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 is what created the FBI. We've always been about technology. The one piece of technology that created the FBI was a car. Before then, you didn't have interstate crime. And uh, once you had the car and people could travel from state to state, you needed an, an agency, a law enforcement agency that could deal with that type of crime. So the FBI was created to do that. Now, as you look at the world, as, as it's evolving, now crime certainly is it's transnational. It, it doesn't just occur here. And now people in another country have the ability to commit a crime in the United States without ever traveling to the United States, which makes our job extremely challenging indeed. So most of the agents coming into the FBI now will, will travel a lot more than they ever did before. You know, we've got legal attache offices around the world where we have FBI agents full-time. We have task forces full-time in other countries. So we, we are a global law enforcement intelligence agency now like we've never been before. On January 1st, a new law goes into effect with the intent of putting the brakes on illegal immigration. Jim Knight of the South Carolina Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation talked with us about what local employers can expect. Starting January 1st, businesses will be faced with a new regulation to help curb illegal immigration. Beginning January 1st, 2009, if you are a private contractor, uh, and you contract with state government, city government, county government, or uh, a school district, you have to begin verifying your workers. And there are other effective dates for those in the private sector as far as verification. Uh, July 1, uh, 2009, if you employ more than 100 workers, 
and July 1, 2010, if you employ less than 100 workers, you've got to be in full compliance with this law. There are two methods in which you can verify that your workers are legal and authorized to work in South Carolina and this country. Uh, the first method available to employers under the law is the E-Verify system. Uh, that's a system set up by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Social Security Administration. And what you're doing is you're taking the Social Security number or the green card number of the job applicant, you're putting that into the system and it's searching the database of the Social Security Administration and Department of Homeland Security to see if that's a good and valid number. Uh, the second method that employers can use for veri verification under the statute is to have the employee present a South Carolina driver's license or a driver's license or, or ID from another state that has requirements as strict as South Carolina's in obtaining a driver's license or a state ID card. The penalty for failing to verify workers can be tough. On a first-time penalty, we can find up to $1,000 uh, per worker involved. Uh, and on a first-time violation, we can waive that if within uh, 72 hours the employer sets up a verification system and begins using it. It's even tougher if you have illegal workers. Then we have no option but to suspend the license of that employer, meaning you can't do business. Uh, for 10 to 30 days on a first time violation. For employment attorneys like Chris Lauderdale, the law goes way too far. The idea that uh, a business can be shut down and all of the individuals working for that business would lose their job for some period of time for violating the statute is pretty extreme. There's really no comparable area of employment law that I can think of uh, where that kind of penalty is imposed. And um, I think maybe that's something if the legislature had the opportunity, I'd like to see them rethink that. Since uh, August, uh, we've been traveling the state talking to civic groups, trade associations, anybody who would invite us in to talk about this new law and to explain uh, how it's uh, going to affect uh, businesses in South Carolina. And in December and in January, we are going to 14 of the 16 technical colleges in the state and we're doing a two-hour training program. If you're interested in finding out more about the law or attending a future forum, check the LLR website for dates. You may also leave your own opinions on the legislation. Are you in the market for a home? This month's Consumer Affairs Minute advises you to beware of mortgage fraud. When it comes to mortgage fraud, we all pay directly or indirectly. Homeowners and home buyers pay directly through increased mortgage costs and higher property taxes because false appraisals increase property values. Indirect costs include taxes and lender costs to fight and prevent such crimes. Through the dedicated effort and cooperation of officials across the state, South Carolina has made dramatic improvements in fighting mortgage fraud over the last seven years. However, mortgage fraud continues to be a significant problem statewide. The department encourages individuals to heed the following mortgage fraud prevention tips. Get referrals for real estate and mortgage professionals when you want to buy or sell a home. Research the sale price of other homes in the neighborhood. Beware of no money down loans. Don't let anyone talk you into making a false statement on your loan application. Never sign a blank document or a document containing blank lines. And always remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. This is Charles Knight with South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs. Job Dick had a great career in the financial market until he decided he wanted to do something else. When he saw an old airplane hangar in West Columbia, he knew he'd found it. You know, it's amazing how, after the fact, how close 
it came to what the original idea was in terms of the way that it, we would break it off and divide it up um, and where the entries would be uh, for the doorways and so forth. Um, a friend of mine came in, you know, while I was negotiating, we literally took pieces of old wood and, I mean, toilet paper and kind of laid it out, so to speak, of, you know, where the breaks in the rooms would be. You know, the, the staircases were, you know, designed by myself and uh, uh, a good friend of mine who does this, you know, in terms of getting my hands dirty and so forth, I don't mind that, but the real kick in the pants for me is the design and pulling it all together. Been here to Carolina, uh, started out in pre-med. Organic chemistry pretty much ended that career and uh, moved into uh, business and uh, specifically uh, finance. There's no ceiling on what you can make and there's no overhead. There's, uh, you know, it's very simply, uh, you know, whatever you can create. When I got there, uh, I think it was uh, more that they wanted you to do it their way and what I was there to learn wasn't necessarily, you know, what uh, um, it ended up uh, working out to be. <laughs> I took a little sabbatical and uh, I'd always wanted to work on big boats, so I uh, packed the car up and went down to uh, Fort Lauderdale and found a uh, captain who uh, thought I could uh, learn my way around a boat and I did that for about a year. When I came back I needed a job. Um, a friend of mine who built cabinets hired me and I uh, worked with him and uh, it just sort of snowballed from there. Uh, when I figured I could kind of do some of this stuff on my own, I started buying tools and uh, bidding jobs myself and uh, went from there to getting my um, commercial GC license and uh, after doing it for other people for a while, uh, you know, put away enough uh, in the piggy bank to buy this piece of property and, and get started. I bought this building in 2003. Um, it was a, uh, a building that had a lot of, uh, to me, a lot of charisma. It had really cool bones with the barrel roof. I'd driven by it several times. Uh, there was a, an old one of those signs that says for sale and it had been probably on the building for so long um, that you could hardly read the numbers. Uh, you had to literally get out of the car and go make them out. And uh, the company uh, was using it just as storage and uh, it was for sale. And um, he and I negotiated for probably a good part of uh, eight months before we made something happen. I had a little bit of my own money left over from some construction jobs, so uh, I jumped in and started with the first unit. Uh, I figured that I needed to kind of get it far enough along where I could go to the banks and give them sort of a, some impression of, of what was, you know, to come later. And uh, so I, I uh, essentially finished the first unit, and when, when that was finished, I uh, made the phone calls and uh, brought the bankers down. And um, they seemed to all be very interested. And uh, when they took it back to their boards, you know, being an unknown developer on a project uh, this size, um, they all pretty much came back to me uh, and explained that uh, as much as they would love to do something a little out of the box, um, that they just, they just didn't feel comfortable. Um, Anne Sinclair uh, at the City Council um, was a big fan of this project. It was in her area and uh, she made some really grandiose introductions for me. Um, several bankers that she knew personally, she uh, asked them to come down here and have a look and give me a hand. Finally got to uh, Don Tomlin who is a sizable uh, developer here in Columbia and uh, he was kind of my uh, my angel, so to speak. When he showed up, uh, you know, it, uh, it finally, things started happening. Um, he made me a nice offer. Um, 
to, to fund a certain portion of it up to a, a point. Um, or uh, he would help me uh, put together a more lasting bank relationship. And uh, I opted for the second one, and um, he basically held my hand through the process, and uh, we got it done. Literally, uh, sometimes it was the night before, um, and sometimes on a cocktail napkin, um, when some of this stuff was drafted design-wise. I had uh, uh, LTC, a local um, um, firm, put together the blueprint for the layout um, and uh, just enough to kind of get me through the, the zoning um, and the, uh, the, the process down in the city um, to get the permit. Um, but after that it was it was literally a, uh, uh, a design as you go, which I tend to have really decided that that's the way I like to do things the best. I have a, an acre in the backyard that I'd like to develop. I have room for uh, several more uh, townhouse style lofts. Um, seems to be a glut of those on the market right now. So um, for right now, I am um, working with uh, uh, homeowners doing renovation, restoration work, uh, remodeling. Until things change, you know, and uh, money loosens up because I would really like to get back to doing this. And now, here's Marilyn Mathias with the state's business news. A struggling economy continued to weaken over the past month. The state unemployment rate rose to 8%, a significant increase over the September rate of 7.3%. Although there were gains in retail trade, which added 2,300 jobs, and construction, which added 800 people, these gains are likely temporary as these industries are expected to mirror national trends over the next few months and fall below normal seasonal levels. Leisure and hospitality showed a seasonal loss of 3,500 jobs, and manufacturers reduced their payrolls by 1,400. Professional and business services added 2,700 jobs in October, mostly in temporary help agencies. Overall, non-farm jobs in October were nearly 21,000 below the year-ago level. Over the past few weeks, there's been more bad news, as Bank of America announced it is expected to eliminate up to 35,000 jobs nationwide over the next three years and Midlands area builders, according to the state newspaper, say business has dropped as much as 36 percent over the last year, marking the lowest level in over 10 years. As the nation continues to suffer a prolonged recession, some economists expect the unemployment rate to rise even higher. The South Carolina Employment Security Commission, which administers unemployment insurance, has said for some weeks now that its trust fund is reaching the level of insolvency. The agency recently requested a $146 million loan from the federal government to provide unemployment insurance benefits through March. There are glimmers of hope across the state as several businesses have announced expansion plans. Appalachian Underwriters Incorporated, an insurance underwriting company, has announced that it will make a $1 million investment and create 50 new jobs in Richland County. Ortec Incorporated has announced completion of the company's second round of expansions and improvements at its manufacturing facility in Piedmont. The plan reflects a combined investment of $7.2 million by the company and the addition of some 30 jobs at the facility. Fisher Tank Company has announced expansion plans in Lexington County. The $6 million investment is expected to generate at least 10 new jobs. Concentrix has announced the expansion of the company's North American headquarters and call center operation in Greenville, a $1 million investment that will bring 40 new jobs. Titanium Holdings Incorporated recently announced that it has selected a headquarters location in Fort Mill. Over the next five years, the company plans to bring up to 300 new jobs to the area to support all of its divisions. AFL Telecommunications, LLC, will expand its operations in Spartanburg County. The $12 million investment is expected to generate 15 new jobs. 
Newcore Steel will invest $45 million over the next five years at its plant in Darlington. The project will include improvements to the existing steel mill facility, such as upgraded equipment, expansion, and the acquisition of land and growth. I'm Marilyn Mathias, and that's this month's Business News. To find out more about the programs and services featured on this show, be sure to visit our website, www.carolinaworks.org. Thanks for watching, and please join us again next time for Carolina Works. Carolina Works is brought to you in part by the South Carolina Occupational Information System, South Carolina's official career resource network and your pathway to success.